Well, good morning. This is uh, Ian R. Crane. It's the morning of Friday, 23rd of February, uh, 2018. And um, the talk of the last 24 hours has been the incredible and staggering hubris of Ineos, headed up by none other than uh, Mr. Burns himself, uh, J.R. Ratcliffe. Uh, who's proving himself to be the arch sociopath. And uh, of course, what we're witnessing is precisely what would become the norm if the transatlantic trade and investment partnership were ever to become established. Because the purpose of the corporatocracy in trying to get the TTIP into place was to establish a raft of global legislation which would give the corporations supremacy over all national and even international law. So without TTIP in place, Mr. Burns, Jim Ratcliffe, has obviously decided that, uh, well, you know, uh, TTIP should be in place, but it's not, so we'll just behave as though it was, and we'll take on anyone and everyone, because we can, because, I've got very deep pockets. I've got access to massive amounts of debt. The banks need me more than I need them. So we're gonna take on all comers. Well, thank you, Jim. Because what you guys did yesterday, you increased the size of the anti-fracking community in the UK by about ooh, four million people, I would say. And uh, even yesterday, somebody contacted me uh, because they had never heard of fracking before. I know that seems incredible to regular viewers of uh, this live stream and people that have been on this case for uh, a number of years now. But uh, this person said they found my name because their daughter had shown them how to use a computer and they looked up fracking and they'd gone to my website, found my uh, contact details and wanted to know a little bit more about fracking. And what did I think about uh, INEOS wanting to sue the National Trust for access. Well, 45 minutes later, we had uh, another convert to the anti-fracking community. And uh, as you probably gathered, this uh, lady uh, would be classified uh, with the uh, geriactivist team. And this is a term of endearment, of course, the term originated in York East Yorkshire. With this small band of retirees who effectively ran Rathlin Energy out of East Yorkshire uh, two and a half years ago. Well, I don't know what the average age of National Trust members is, but uh, I'm guessing that it's uh, probably the wrong side of 50 and maybe even the wrong side of 60, because these are the people that you know, have time and would like to use that time to visit and explore the national heritage of this country. And uh, so consequently, they pay their dues to be members of the National Trust, which gives them access to the uh, beautiful National Trust properties dotted around the country. But uh, INEOS seem to think that uh, National Trust properties are fair game. And uh, let me just give you a quote from Lynn Calder, who is the commercial director of INEOS Shale. And I'm sure Lynn Calder, I'm sure she's a real piece of work. Um, but, uh, you know, a graduate of Robert Gordon University, who spent uh, uh, the last decade or so uh, in the oil and gas industry. So she says, legal action has been a last resort and we have used powers which prevent landowners from blocking projects which benefit wider community and the nation as a whole. God damn, you know, what an arch sociopath. You'd have to be a sociopath to even think that, let alone write it or say it. There's no intention of INEOS to benefit the wider community. You know, their intention is to reduce the cost of their feedstock, of the raw materials that they use for producing plastics. So it doesn't matter how you look at this, INEOS is way out there on a limb. Now, you know, if, if I was benevolent, I might actually consider that Greg Clark has played a blinder here because clearly the British government does not want to be seen to be pulling the plug 
on this industry after doing nothing but encouraging it for the last nearly eight years. Ever since David Brown, uh, David Brown, David Cameron appointed Lord John Brown, former chairman of BP, to be his special energy advisor about a week after getting elected to uh, prime minister in uh, May of 2010. From that point forward, it was push for the green energy, as he called it, of shale gas. Well, fortunately, the country has educated itself dramatically since then. Of course, it was helped by the triggering of the two seismic events by Quadrilla uh, back in 2011, when they damaged the well at Priest Hall, knew they damaged the well and continued to frack. And uh, that actually resulted in the two seismic events on April the 1st and May 27th of 2011. And that started the process. And, it, and obviously there were a number of people who realized this wasn't a good idea before that, but this galvanized those people into action. But uh, fortunately, the government put a moratorium in place, which was, they thought, a smart move because it would give everything, uh, everyone time to reflect, to the dust to settle. And then in a little while, they would lift the moratorium, which of course they did in December 2012. But here we are. A little over five years later and the mood of the British public is not one of acceptance. People have done their own research, people have looked at what this industry has done pretty much everywhere in the world where it's become established and uh, have, have realized that basically this isn't an industry that they want in there or anybody else's backyard. And so the anti-fracking community has gone from strength to strength. And uh, what INEOS have done now is to galvanize that even further, but call it a hunch. Maybe, maybe Greg Clark went to uh, Dr. Andy Samuel at the Oil and Gas Authority and said, Andy, mate, we got a problem. We need to pull the plug on this, but we don't want it to be seen that the British government is actually pulling the plug. So um, we're losing the support of the British public and we just need it to go away. And one of them maybe said, well, of course, uh, you know, we can raise the profile in the eyes of the British public. I know we spent the last five years trying to play it down, but now we could perhaps raise the profile big time. Mm. How do we do that, Andy? Well, maybe, just maybe, we could tell INEOS to take the National Trust to court. That should do it. That's brilliant, Andy. That's absolutely brilliant. Let's do that. Okay, Andy, I'm gonna leave it to you as head of the Oil and Gas Authority. You tell INEOS that, sorry guys, it's out of our hands. You're gonna to have to take the National Trust to court. They might not do it. No, 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 they're gonna do it because James Ratcliffe is so arrogant that he could not resist the challenge, so he will do it. So consider the possibility, Jimbo, that you have fallen right into Greg Clark and Andy Samuel's trap, for which we are extremely grateful. Of course, you won't see it that way. You will be in complete denial with your team of sociopaths. And, uh, you know, who else have we got other than Lynn Corder? Well, of course, we've got Ron Coyle, who's the CEO of Ineos Shale. And of course, Ron is a proven sociopath. He's worked with Ineos for 20 years. So you know very well that he will do basically whatever it is you tell him to do, regardless of the consequences to the wider community, which uh, Lynn Corder claims you actually have an interest in. And then of course, we have Tom Pickering, uh, who's the operations officer. And uh, we've seen Tom Pickering, of course, in action. We've seen him lose the debates massively wherever he's gone out. Gary Haywood, of course, having got totally spanked by Dennis Skinner in uh, Nottingham about a year ago, he uh, did the right thing and uh, decided it was time to uh, take retirement. Well, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt that it was his choice. But Peter Riley, who of course has subsequently also left the company as your PR guy, had his head in his hands as Dennis Skinner spanked Gary at that debate. And then in Eckington, just a few months ago, we saw Tom Pickering get the same treatment um, by debating uh, David Esteban of uh, Eckington against fracking. 
But Pickering doesn't seem to care. He's got a Kevlar skin. He walks into the proverbial lion's den, believing that it really doesn't matter what the plebs think. Here, we'll just go through the motions of pretending that we're interested in getting social license, but we're just gonna steamroll it through anyway. All the talk of social license, of course, from a few years ago has now evaporated because the government and the industry know that there is zero possibility of this getting social license anywhere uh, in the UK. So here we are in uh, Nottinghamshire. I'm at the uh, Misson Springs Protection Camp, uh, just a few miles away from Tinker Lane, which is just a few miles away from Clumber Park, which seems to be Ineos's prime National Trust target. So needless to say, Frackery Nottinghamshire, and then just across the uh, border in uh, Derbyshire, the anti-fracking communities there are absolutely incandescent at this and uh, have every intention, of course, of showing uh, their support for the National Trust. And in fact, there is a uh, walk from Clown in, um, uh, and, and to Bolsover in Derbyshire and I'm sh tomorrow, and I'm sure that much of the discussion uh, by people attending that event will be what INEOS are doing with the National Trust. But, you know, don't see this as a problem. I think it's brilliant. It's a fantastic opportunity. Because as I uh, saw yesterday with this lady who'd never heard of fracking before, and now she is not only well briefed, but she is motivated to do her own research and call it a hunch that when she's down at the next Women's Institute meeting, I'm sure she's going to be sharing her uh, insights. So this is a massive opportunity for the British government and for the anti-fracking community to put the final nail in the coffin of unconventional gas exploitation in the UK. But, you know, we've also got to be very careful because whenever anything happens like this, you always get somebody or some group who says, yes, okay, this is the time that the anti-fracking community all needs to come together, uh, all needs to come together under one banner and uh, needs some coordination. And, uh, oh, oh, uh, we volunteer. Anytime you hear anybody say that, it's time to turn and walk in the opposite direction. The reason that the anti-fracking community has been so successful over the past five years is because it has evolved as an extremely well interconnected, amorphous morass of individuals, of small groups, of NGOs, all doing their own thing, all contributing in their own way, not having to report to anyone, not having to take anybody else's thoughts into account. If they think something's a good idea, they run with it. And the government and the industry have absolutely no idea how to deal with this. So anyone who suggests any kind of coordination, then I'm sure whilst they're probably doing it with the best of intentions, with all due respect, it's naive. It's politically naive. When something ain't broke, and not only ain't broke, working extremely well, it ain't the time to try and fix it. So whatever you as an individual, or you as your small group or large group or whatever, or you as you, the NGO, just do whatever it is that you think is appropriate. And if somebody else thinks it's a good idea, then they'll tag along or they'll pick up on it. Like a lot of people, including me, think it's a great idea to modify their social media to show their support for the National Trust. So on the Ian Rowland Crane Facebook page, I've added the frame of Frack Free National Trust to my uh, thumbnail picture there. And I would encourage people to do the same. I'm not a member of Frack Free National Trust because as such, it doesn't exist as a group. It's showing solidarity. And I think that Frack Free National Trust as a non-existent group is going to be the fastest growing anti-fracking non-existent community that we've seen over the last five years. And it's going to be incredibly powerful and influential. And uh, INEOS, in their hubris, have no idea. They, they are incapable of comprehending the magnitude of the opposition that uh, they have triggered. 
Uh, and you know what? I'm extremely grateful because I think um, INEOS's announcement that they're going to take on the National Trust has actually served to accelerate the demise of this insidious abomination. But uh, it ain't over yet. You know, that fat lady, she's still gargling, but uh, she hasn't yet put the glass down and she's not yet walked out the door of the dressing room. So, you know, we have to do whatever it is that we feel we need to do, want to do, can do, to hammer that final nail home. And uh, never let uh, people hide behind a corporate logo. It's not Ineos, it's Jim Ratcliffe, it's Lynn Calder, it's Ron Coyle, and it's Tom Pickering. And there's a few others in there, but let's start with those four. It is individuals who are making this decision, hiding behind the corporate logo, not putting any personal stake into the game because they're using company funding. <clears throat> so I'm not yet gonna get my golf clubs out of storage, but uh, I do sense that it could be that in 2018, I do get that opportunity to play that first round once uh, this is dead and, um, and buried. But you know what? We've also got iGas here, Missen Springs. Now, yesterday I speculated that um, iGas might have decided to stop work at Missen Springs on the basis of uh, the massive response that they got from the community here, despite getting permission to work beyond the start of the bird breeding season on the 1st of February. And then they seemed to stop abruptly about a week ago. And yesterday, I was sent some uh, aerial photographs uh, by you know, anonymously. Um, and these aerial photographs show that uh, actually iGas have walked away with the pad construction nowhere near complete. So there is some speculation that iGas have actually had to stop work due to breaching the noise level limits that uh, have been set. If they do continue, well, because they're continuing working in breach of clause 21, which they were given permission to do, of course, by uh, the planning officer of Nottinghamshire County Council. But if they have breached the noise levels, then they would be required to stop work. So um, we will make inquiries at Nottinghamshire County Council. And if they're not forthcoming, then obviously we'll submit freedom of information requests to establish precisely why IAGAS have stopped work here at Misson Springs. But of course, it doesn't stop them working because they're still focused at uh, Tinker Lane. But surely the smart thing to do would be for IGAS to submit their finances to the uh, Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy ahead of the curve. Because uh, otherwise, you know, they're gonna build these pads, bring all the equipment in, pass supposedly all the technical uh, requirements, and um, then maybe fail the financial tests, which is of course exactly what happened to Barclays Bank trading as third energy at Kirby Misperton. So, you know, if, I guess, are not readily submitting their financial statements for analysis up front, then maybe we have to ask the question why, because maybe they're trying to do some fancy footwork in the hope that uh, they can actually uh, pass those requirements when the time comes, or hope that, or that Greg Clark isn't still in the job and you've got an arch sociopath in there like uh, Jeremy Hunt. So uh, anyway, let's um, see what uh, transpires there. But uh, today, uh, I've got a couple of more things, but today, a couple of shout outs. <clears throat> First of all, to my daughter, who it's her birthday today, so happy birthday. Sorry I can't be with you, but um, you understand why. Um, but I'd love to give a shout out. It's not something I normally do, but I think this is absolutely worthy of the recognition that it deserves. And that's to Ben Devoy. Now, Ben has been a stalwart campaigner on the anti-fracking campaign certainly since um, Barton Moss. That's when I first remember coming into contact uh, with Ben. And, um, you know, Ben's style of campaigning is absolutely unique, very effective, but his commitment is absolute. And uh, yesterday in court, where he had been part of a lock-on, the judge in his um, sentencing gave everybody uh, the, the same fines and costs but then he singled two of the people out because he wanted to restrict their capability to participate in any further action by taking their driving licenses away. 
Now, Ben wasn't one of them, but Ben immediately stood up in court and said, if you're going to single those people out, then I want you to take my driver's license away as well. And that triggered a whole nother debate in the court. And eventually the judge backed off, realizing that if he took all of these licenses away, then it might actually um, set uh, an interesting set of wheels in motion. Obviously there would undoubtedly be appeals and uh, that would run the risk of setting case law. So he backed off and uh, those two people who were under threat of losing their license have retained their license thanks to the selfless reaction of Ben Devoy. And you know, one of the things that we've learned over the last five years is who it is that you need on your shoulder when you're on the front line. And Ben, you can stand on my shoulder anytime, my friend, because what you did yesterday is a prime example of the solidarity and the conviction of the people within the anti-fracking movement. So if any of you get an opportunity to get onto uh, Ben's social media, please acknowledge that uh, tremendous uh, reaction that he had in court yesterday. You know, stick it to the judiciary, Ben. A few years ago, I would have not hesitated to defend the judiciary in this country, but I've seen the magnitude of the corruption. I've seen the way in which judges behaviours changes after they've clearly received a phone call and instructions from on high. And they may think that they can break the anti-fracking community by taking such uh, action as trying to take people's driver's licences away, as North Yorkshire police did with me, but I won't bore you with the details of that. But uh, you know, this is a fantastic result. And so well done, Ben. Absolutely uh, fantastic. So my final item today is to actually bring a bit of attention back to Greg Clark because, you know, whilst I've given Greg Clark the benefit of the doubt over his handling of um, the uh, uh, application by Barclays Bank Trading as Third Energy to frack at uh, Kirby Misperton and effectively pulling the plug on them because their finances don't stand up to scrutiny. But just a couple of days ago, or three days ago in fact, uh, Greg appeared before a parliamentary select committee and uh, when he was being questioned about uh, the uh, employment situation in the country, he made this observation. He said, we should take some pride in the fact that we have a high level of employment and a low level of unemployment in the UK. I would not want to swap that for a country in which there are high levels of unemployment. Unfortunately, that statement shows the magnitude of the disconnect between a boy who was raised on Teesside but made good, went to Cambridge University, has uh, had a career that has brought him into the position of Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, yet he appears to be oblivious to the fact that uh, we don't have high levels of employment in this country. What we have is a corporatocracy that is abusing the human resources in this country by putting people on zero hours contracts or guaranteed eight hours a week. Well, or let me tell you, 16 hours. And you know, there's a lot of people I know in the Southwest who struggle to be able to make ends meet because their unscrupulous employers would rather have a whole raft of people on 16 hours a week than a few people on uh, a full week. Now, if people want to work part-time, that's fine. But there's a very, very large chunk of people who are desperate to be able to get a full week's work but are being restricted because it is in the financial interests of the companies to keep their hours below six or around 16 le and less hours a week. And when you're working 16 hours on eight pound, and no doubt we're gonna hear a lot from the British government in the next few weeks, how on the 1st of April, the minimum wage is going to seven, hour, seven pound 83, whoopee doo. Because 40 hours on seven pound 83 is not a living wage. What we have is a nation that is in corporate slavery and we have a government that is actually either ignorant or enabling that to continue. And of course, this is the same government that is trying to force universal credit onto uh, benefits claimants. And uh, we've got a situation now where 43% of people claiming disability benefits who have had their benefits sanctioned have attempted to commit suicide 
and that's risen from 21% over the last seven years. So yes, obviously my focus in these broadcasts is to shut down the unconventional gas industry in this country, but it is symptomatic of a much, much deeper problem in this country. And until such time as the people get involved, and what the anti-fracking community is showing is that when people get involved, you can make a massive difference. But if you don't, the government thanks you for your apathy. You have a great weekend, and I'll be back with you on Monday at 8.30. And if you're anywhere in the Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire, South Yorkshire area, then take a look at the Frack Free Nottinghamshire or Frack Free Derbyshire Facebook pages and join the walk tomorrow from Clown to Bolsover and meet with like-minded people. And I'm sure you're going to meet a lot of new people who are totally incensed by the INEOS attempt to sue the National Trust for access on its property to conduct seismic surveys. And don't think they'll stop there, because if they get that permission, then they think they will be back to start drilling. You have a great weekend. I'll see you on Monday.